Welcome to NTD News. I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. A Border Patrol official says most family units are now being allowed into the United States. And in San Diego, one school district is teaching migrant children in person before their own students. The governor of Florida plans to take executive action against vaccine passports. And a former Clinton advisor warns about the dangers of making these mandatory. But what's the Biden administration's stance? A ninth woman comes forward to accuse New York Governor Andrew Cuomo of sexual misconduct. She says Cuomo kissed her cheeks and flirted with her while visiting her home. A Roman Catholic funeral is held for Officer Eric Talley. Talley was killed in the line of duty while engaging an active gunman in a Colorado grocery store. President Biden's global summit on climate change is just weeks away. Leaders of China and Russia are invited. Biden's administration deems farming reforms crucial to meeting their climate goals. Some Wisconsin farmers are now saying they want to be part of the conversation. The majority of family units crossing the border are now being released into the United States. That's according to a senior Border Patrol official who spoke with the Epic Times on condition of anonymity. The Biden administration has moved away from sending families back across the border. Using the health emergency measure called Title 42, a Texas Democrat lawmaker told CBS News Sunday that families with children under 13 years old are being allowed in. The family units are being released into the United States. That's where the burden of the border communities are felt, the cities, the counties. The NGOs, we're feeling the blunt of what's happening with the family units. Every night, the recently opened shelter at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church in Mission, Texas, fills up with up to 200 migrants. This mother came from Guatemala with her husband and three-year-old daughter. The truth is, thank God, President Biden gave the opportunity for minors to be allowed in. It's joyous that our girl was so young so we could come and be here. The shelter feeds the migrants and offers them essential items and a bed for the night or longer. You know, if you, you see a person who has no place to stay and nothing to eat, and they ask you if you could help them, you help them. And it's an honor to do it. It's, not, it's an honor to share this part of the journey with them. A Border Patrol official said 86 percent of family units apprehended last Thursday were released into the United States. HHS is taking in unaccompanied minors, and most single adults are still being expelled. Meanwhile, San Diego public school teachers are giving migrant children in-person instruction before their own students. That's according to a Fox News report. One mother in the district told Fox, We agree that every child deserves an in-person education. But why are taxpaying students put last? A folkswoman confirmed to Fox the district told teachers they could volunteer to teach migrant children this week during spring break. She said she doesn't know if they're getting paid to do it. And that's up to the county. The district expects to move to in-person instruction in about a couple of weeks. Dozens of unaccompanied minors who crossed the U.S.-Mexico border illegally have tested positive for the CCP virus. They are now at a San Diego shelter. The Department of Health and Human Services spokesperson Bonnie Preston told NBC7 that at least 69 minors tested positive and were all asymptomatic. Preston says there are now 723 girls sheltering at the San Diego Convention Center. Around 250 more are expected to arrive every other day until capacity is reached. The San Diego County Supervisor confirmed to News 8 that there were positive cases of the CCP virus among the unaccompanied children, but that none of the cases was serious enough for the children to be hospitalized. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said vaccine passports are unacceptable. He's even gone so far as to plan executive action against them. And a former Clinton advisor says if these become mandatory, it will put an end to human liberty in the West. Here are the details. Governor DeSantis is planning emergency executive action against the push to require vaccine passports for Americans to travel around the country or the world. Uh, It's completely unacceptable for either the government or the private sector to impose upon you uh, the requirement that you show proof of vaccine to just simply be able to participate in normal society. 
In early March, DeSantis already made it clear he won't stand for them, and he said it was totally off the table. We're not supportive of that. Um, I think it's something that people have certain freedoms and individual liberties to make decisions for themselves. Bill Clinton's former re-election campaign advisor, Naomi Wolf, is an outspoken liberal and a feminist. She told Fox News making vaccine passports mandatory would be the end of human liberty in the West. She gives part of the reason why. It can be merged with your PayPal account, with your digital currency. Microsoft uh, is already talking about merging it with um, payment plans. Wolf noted it happened in Israel, and months later it became apparent that activists were shunned and constantly kept under surveillance. The Biden administration is not creating CCP virus vaccine passports, but its officials are working with private companies. The administration is helping these companies set guidelines for the passport systems. Those systems can be used for people to show proof when they've been vaccinated. Jen Psaki told this to reporters at the White House press conference on Monday. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg clarified the details of an upcoming infrastructure improvement bill. He now says that a mileage tax is not part of the plan. You're going to hear more details from the administration in the coming days about how to pay for this. But one thing I will do is reiterate the president's commitment that his proposals will not raise taxes at all on anyone making under $400,000 a year. Last week, Buttigieg suggested a mileage tax showed a lot of promise to help pay for an infrastructure plan. It would tax people based on how many miles they drive and would be seen as an alternative to raising the gas tax. But he received significant pushback on social media for this idea. Critics say a mileage tax would impact low-income earners too much. Buttigieg says he wants to find a way to fund the upcoming infrastructure plan that doesn't burden the middle class. With climate change being one of Biden's immediate priorities, how will he make changes in America to meet his goals? One idea is to get farmers to use conservation practices. Wisconsin farmers tell NTD they want to work with Biden on this issue, but they want to be part of the conversation. NTD's Melina Weiskopf has the story. Biden's new secretary for Department of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, says agriculture will be a key area to push Biden's climate agenda. He says he thinks agriculture is probably the first and best way to begin getting some wins in the climate area. One idea is to have more farmers practice conservation farming. That means farmers will use techniques like no-tilling in cover crops. I think that it would help tremendously if, if the uh, governments were looking at uh, conservation practices. Some farmers already put these conservation techniques into practice, like here in Dodge County, Wisconsin. In order to encourage farmers across the nation to follow suit, these Wisconsin farmers offer a word of advice. That you can't go guns blazing and plant every single acre into it, that otherwise you're, you're destined to fail and then you're never going to want to try again, where if you ease into it, you learn as you go. You're going to have better success. You're going to see the benefits from it. And they're urging the Biden administration not to push quick government mandates, but instead incentivize farmers to transition into conservation practices. Yes, they've done the research that this proves this, but at the same time, if it's not aptical to be profitable or to be have time to do it is another thing that we also need to take two steps back and look, is this practical because a farm that's milking a thousand cows is way different than my farm that's only milking 80 cows. The farmers say they're willing to try out something new, but that communication and cooperation should be at the center of Biden's decision making. Because as the saying goes, what's good in theory is not always good in practice. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. The Supreme Court has kept the legal fight going on Kentucky's abortion law. The high court agreed to decide next term whether the state's attorney general can defend the controversial legislation. A lower court already struck down the law, but Attorney General Daniel Cameron tried to defend the law after the state's Secretary of Health and Family declined to do so. The Sixth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals had barred Cameron from filing the appeal. Now it'll be up to the Supreme Court to have the final say. After the two deadly mass shootings this month, President Biden is expected to sign executive orders on gun control. And he's also confident new bills will pass the Senate soon. But do gun owners think tighter measures will help reduce mass shootings? NTD's Allison Lee has the details. Several gun owners at a gun event in Morgantown, Pennsylvania, told NTD this past Saturday that they do not believe tighter gun control measures will help reduce gun violence. 
I don't think that the bills, no, not necessarily. Um, I don't think that the bills really make a difference. I think while something happens like that in Colorado, um, there's millions of gun owners in the United States that don't break the law, don't cause you know violence every day. So I think it's more of a mental health. Um, somebody needs to check on that person. Mitchell says he doesn't mind tighter background checks and longer wait times and also supports red flag laws. But he doubts the effectiveness of mental health checkups. I mean, I don't really know how much they're going to have unless they're sitting down with somebody and examining everybody. And to do it on a mass scale is almost virtually impossible. Um, you know, I think that it's more you would encourage people that know that person to try to reach out before something like that would happen. Another gun owner who's reluctant to be on TV, however, disagrees with red flag laws, saying registration will always lead to confiscation. He also doesn't believe longer wait times will help given the recent Colorado shooting. Frankly speaking, the shooting that just happened, the, the guy got his gun legally, right? What, what, what's going to make a difference between waiting like, you know, one day versus waiting 10 days? This is, is not going to make a difference at all. Nelly says he doesn't believe the government will go door to door confiscating guns yet, but banning a certain class of firearms will always lead to banning more classes of firearms. Look, look what happened in Australia. It started with, oh yeah, you know, we're just going to ban assault weapons. And then next thing you know, pistols are gone. Next thing you know, semi-automatic rifles are gone. Next thing you know, all you have is shotguns, pretty much. And it's really hard to get them. He also says these measures will always start small and then move big. Tyrannical regimes have always done it this way, he says, because they don't want people to have guns. Allison Lee, NTD News. Another woman accuses Governor Andrew Cuomo of inappropriate sexual behavior. The woman says she'll cooperate with the investigations into Cuomo. Sherry Ville says Cuomo acted sexually toward her when visiting her home to survey flood damage to the area in the wake of a storm. She says at the time, Cuomo forcibly kissed her on her cheeks and told her she was beautiful. He said, that's what Italians do, kiss both cheeks. I felt shocked and didn't understand what had just happened, but I knew I felt embarrassed and weird about his kissing me. Vil says Cuomo's behavior has nothing to do with their heritage. I am Italian and in my family, family members kiss. Strangers do not kiss, especially upon meeting someone for the first time. Vil says Cuomo waited for his staff to walk out before making a flirtatious comment to her. Governor Cuomo lagged behind them. He stopped, he turned to me and said, you are beautiful. That made me feel even more uncomfortable. I felt as though he was coming on to me in my own home. She says Cuomo took her hand and asked her if there was anything else she wanted. She says he kissed her cheek aggressively while holding her hand and face. I felt like I was being manhandled, especially because he was holding my face and he was kissing my cheek again. Phil says in her business, she interacts with male customers and vendors routinely, and Cuomo's behavior was different. I know the difference between an innocent gesture and a sexual one. Phil says the incident occurred in front of her family and the governor's staff. She says her neighbors and customers teased her afterwards. They called her the governor's new girlfriend. Bill says she doesn't want to press any charges. She says she wants to help the investigations into Cuomo's conduct. An Alaska senator who voted in favor of convicting former President Trump in his second impeachment trial is facing a challenge for her seat. Republican Kelly Shabaka launched her Senate campaign on Monday against Senator Lisa Murkowski. Shabaka is a former commissioner for Alaska's Department of Administration. Murkowski was first appointed to her Senate seat in 2002 by her father. He gave her his old position after he was elected governor of Alaska. Murkowski did not vote for Trump in 2020 and told The Hill she wrote in a candidate. Earlier this month, Trump said he planned to campaign against Murkowski. In her campaign video, Shabaka called Murkowski out of touch for voting to remove Donald Trump from office. Trump won Alaska by 10 points in 2020. A memorial service is held for police officer Eric Talley. Talley was killed in the line of duty when he led a team into a Colorado gr grocery store to engage an active shooter. His actions likely saved lives.
A traditional Catholic Mass was held for Officer Eric Talley at the Cathedral Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Denver. Police say Talley led the initial team of officers into the store upon arriving on the scene of the shooting. Ten people died there. The Boulder Police Twitter page says, No other individuals were shot or killed after these brave officers engaged the suspect. Archbishop Samuel Aquila spoke at the service. And Jesus has told us, greater love than this, no man has than to lay down his life. And Eric lived that. Aquila offers condolences to Tally's family. For your husband, for your dad, and for your son. He also addressed the police officers in attendance. And also to the police officers who are here, know too that you are in my prayers. He called Tally an example of the sacrifices and risks officers take to protect lives, adding that these sacrifices are often taken for granted. Eric has shown what is best about the service you give to our community, to our cities, and to our country. Tally's father says his son took an unusual route to becoming a police officer. He explained his son held a master's degree in computer communications, but left his office job at 40 years old to serve his community. Tally's father says his son was a devoted father to seven children, and he, quote, knew the Lord. Coming up, a group in Texas is filing a lawsuit against Congress. They want a new presidential election, as well as an injunction to help stop the border crisis. An expert explains what to do to increase your chances of survival during a mass shooting and how to avoid danger in the first place. Find out more on NTD News. As you may have heard, a rapper known as Lil Nas X has been involved in selling shoes that have a drop of human blood in them. They're called Satan shoes, and they're made with Nike sneakers. Now Nike is suing the company selling the altered shoes. That's because Nike says the company did so without their approval. Take a look. Nike sued a New York-based company on Monday over their Satan shoes, a pair of Nike Air Max 97 sneakers that contain a drop of human blood made in collaboration with American singer and rapper Lil Nas X. The company MSCHF Product Studios started selling the black and red devil-themed shoes online this week. Nike said in its filing to a New York federal court that they were produced, quote, without Nike's approval and authorization. The company added they were in no way connected with this project. Lil Nas X is not named as a defendant in the suit. Nike asked the court to immediately stop MSCHF from fulfilling orders and requested a jury trial to seek damages. A woman loses a personal injury lawsuit after a judge throws out the case. This is because her lawyer says he couldn't wear a mask in court. The lawsuit, which focused on a 2017 car crash that fractured the woman's leg, was on its way to trial. The New York Daily News reports that attorney Howard Greenwald said he couldn't breathe wearing the mask in a newly reopened court. Greenwald says he doesn't have a problem with the mask rule, but he was speaking with difficulty and was physically unable to do his job while wearing a mask. But the judge insisted the lawyer follow mask rules and toss the case. The judge told the newspaper that the woman would still have a way to continue the case, even though he dismissed it. One lawyer in Texas is filing a lawsuit against all members of Congress. They're asking for a new presidential election and an injunction on the current administration. A group is suing the entire U.S. Congress, among others. Paul Davis, representing Latinos for Trump and Blacks for Trump, and others, are asking for damages and a constitutional election. We're taking down the two parties, the corrupt uh, so establishment in the two patrol, parties. We're also asking we for injunctive relief. So until we control. have, until trial... We're asking for the court to put a restraining Literally, order on Congress and, and on Biden six, from uh, changing our laws without constitutional authority. authority. Defendants include Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, and Mark Zuckerberg. Ours is a civil rights right lawsuit. We're not seeking to change the winner of the election. We're seeking a new election. No other lawsuit has done that. Davis said the lawsuit could also help stop the border crisis by restraining Biden's border policies from being enacted. Locals in Laredo, Texas, say they're concerned about border security. 
The town sits at the border and the Rio Grande runs beside it, dividing the U.S. and Mexico. This river is a matter of national harmed? security. This is our national border. Jen Lowe, president of Texans United for America, said an organization that's against the wall claims that building the wall would pollute the river. Well, what we would like to know is if you're so upset about the river being polluted and that's your whole basis for not wanting to build a wall, then why are you not calling Mexico out for dumping tons and tons of sewage into the Rio Grande River every single day? So it's hypocrisy. They claim the current administration is not doing anything to fix the border crisis. Instead, it's getting worse as more people cross the border, overfilling encampments. We're barely getting out of uh, the curfew. A couple of weeks ago, we couldn't go out past 10 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock. But yet, all, all these people are coming in, and kids, and we don't know if they have COVID. How is it going to affect our city? When are we going to be released? When are kids going to go to school? When uh, all the jobs are uh, going to be fully open? They say they're also there to raise awareness about kids crossing the border by themselves. What kind of, what I won't even want. say parent, what kind of person would just let your kid, nine, ten-year-old kids, and you see them just coming by themselves you thousands of miles, when here you in the United States we, we take care of our pets better than they've been traded for the past, I don't know, two, three weeks that they get here, and yet we encourage them more to come over here. According to Davis, the grassroots lawsuit has been growing fast. They plan to have a bus tour to Washington, D.C. and serve the lawsuit to Congress. Eileen Ng, NTD News. Former President Donald Trump launches a new website. It's dedicated to preserving the legacy of his administration and his activism since leaving office. The webpage says that the office of Donald J. Trump will continue to advance the America First agenda. The website's About page celebrates the former president's legacy on key policy issues. It mentions his handling of the CCP virus pandemic, securing the southern border, and the peace deals in the Middle East. The 45office.com website was registered a week before Trump departed the White House, but the page remained blank until Monday. DonaldJTrump.com was also revamped. The two sites marked Trump's first digital footprints after social media giants banned him. Mass shooting incidents in America increased almost 40% in 2020 compared to 2019. After the horrific mass shootings in Atlanta and Boulder, a lifelong law enforcement officer is telling people how to protect themselves if they're caught in this kind of dangerous situation. Jim Fuda is the director of Crime Stoppers in Puget Sound in Washington. He is a public safety advisor and has been serving the public since 1972. He has a simple warning for when you feel in danger. Recognize that you're probably in danger and trust your gut. He told NTD it takes a while not only for the mind to process these things, but also to get away quickly. Get out of the situation the second you hear shots. If you feel uncomfortable, leave. Fuda says if you can't run, then try to hide. He emphasizes while you are hiding, make sure to stay quiet and wait for police to arrive. And no furtive movements, no jumping uh, uh, on policemen, thank you, or whatever it might be, or you might be. So just follow the orders. Everything's at that point is most likely going to be okay. However, he said as a last resort, and if exposed, then there will only be one choice. Then you're going to fight. You're, you're gonna, if you can't get away and, and they know where you're at and you're not hiding, then, then you're going to have to fight, and that's going to be the fight of your life. He said that if a fight breaks out, there are certain objectives. Keep, try to keep the gun from going up. Someone push the hand down and then hopefully someone else can hit him with something uh, and, and try to, and so that gun doesn't go off, uh, you know, in the vital areas. But oftentimes people are not aware of what's going on around them. They stare at cell phones or are talking to others. So um, I would suggest uh, as best you can uh, put your cell phone away when you're in a, especially in an unfamiliar environment. Fuda recommends being more alert and observant when you are at schools, airports, or movie theaters. But it's not limited to these places alone. And now, now the grocery store stuff, so it's, it's wherever you're at. The, the, the situation um, uh, could happen anywhere. He says people need to prepare themselves for dangerous situations. Fuda suggests people ask themselves questions about their surroundings. Well, how can I get out of here if I have to? If somebody ap- approaches me, is there, is there someone I can go, go tell right away? By focusing on these several tips, he says personal safety becomes second nature. Authorities say five people were killed in a helicopter crash in Alaska Saturday. 
One of them was billionaire Peter Kellner, who according to Forbes magazine is the Czech Republic's richest man. Another Czech Republic resident, 50-year-old Benjamin Larache, also died in the crash. Three others were killed as well. 52-year-old Gregory Harms of Colorado, 38-year-old Alaska resident Sean McManamy, and the pilot, 33-year-old Alaska resident Zachary Russell. A sixth person on the helicopter was injured. 48-year-old Czech Republic resident David Horvath was hospitalized and in serious but stable condition. And just ahead, bird-watching enthusiasts find reprieve from the pandemic in New York City's Central Park. Seasoned hobbyists say all newcomers need is a pair of binoculars. And film enthusiasts return to one of Hollywood's most famous theaters. The, C, the, TLC, the TCL Chinese Theater reopened for special monster movie showings on Monday. All that and more on NTD News. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me, we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever. Just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 866-239-2619 today for your free copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. The glory of piano masterpieces from the Baroque, Classical, and Romantic periods. New Tang Dynasty Television invites you to join the 2021 NTD International Piano Competition. Together, we preserve and revitalize the art of authentic classical piano music. October 2021 in New York City. Register now at piano.ntdtv.com. Someone has to find a way to build the Great Dome. Completely new, completely original. Over the past year, New York City's largest food pantry has been feeding tens of thousands of families impacted by the pandemic. And now they're expanding their outreach. In Flushing, New York, La Jornada is considered the largest food pantry in the city. It moved to that neighborhood in March 2020, expecting 1,000 families a week. But they soon found the lines of families growing longer and longer. So from that moment on, we started to, to work on getting more food, more food, more food until we were able to get to a point where we are right now, when basically comfortably serving 10,000 plus families a week. La Jornada was founded in 2008 and has been serving Queens ever since. They've been working mostly with migrants and others in need. Rodriguez says the community they serve is 50% Asian. He says they've asked for police protection to address increased crime in the area. The police have been very helpful on that. They have been uh, walking around and walk, helping us throughout the whole process. Yeah, it is a need, okay, and uh, hopefully it's a need that is temporary because, you know, we're going to learn how to live with each other. And that's the, that's the most important thing that we can do right now. La Jornada receives government aid and food donations from City Harvest and private donors. New Yorkers flock to Central Park to enjoy a hobby low on cost and high on relaxation. That's right, bird watching. All you need is a pair of binoculars. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. It's a beautiful day in Central Park, especially for longtime bird watcher and naturalist Gabriel Willa. New York City is entering its second pandemic spring, but now there's an end in sight. Last spring, things were still 
really scary. You know, it, there were so many unknowns about transmission and, and, you know, was it surfaces, was it uh, airborne, and just a lot of things. Enthusiasts call the hobby birding. David Barrett, another avid bird watcher, points out that expensive gear isn't required. Birding doesn't require a lot of fancy equipment. You don't have to spend a lot to go birding. But one thing you really should have, binoculars. And you don't have to buy expensive ones. Barrett runs the Manhattan Bird Alert on Twitter. He recommends getting a smartphone adapter for your binoculars that allows you to take pictures of the birds. Friends Danny Katz and Jody Prusen started coming to Central Park to enjoy the benefits of bird watching, like spending time in nature. But it's really been a source of um, of sublime joy, I have to honestly say. Mary Jane Boland, a longtime birder, often talks to those just getting started with the hobby. She says she tries to gauge their long-term interest in it. I've really talked to a lot of newcomers because I'd like them, once they can do anything, to still want to watch birds and protect birds. For now, the birds in New York's Central Park have a captive audience. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Washington, D.C.'s famous cherry blossoms have reached peak bloom. Officials are urging the public to see the flowering trees virtually, and visitors say they feel lucky to be there in person. Melina Weiskup brings us more from D.C. D.C.'s cherry blossoms are always a beautiful sight to behold, gathering people from all different states and from around the globe. But this year, watching these flowers bloom is a much more precious experience for some. One woman telling us that this is the first vacation she's had since the virus lockdowns began. This is a first vacation after one year and it's, it's really beautiful and my heart is filled with all these flowers. It's been warm, so D.C.'s cherry blossom trees reached peak bloom on Sunday. This is a few days earlier than estimated. It's breathtaking. It's so beautiful. I love it. Um, I didn't really know what to expect, just being that it's still late March, I wasn't sure if they'd all be in bloom or not. The National Park Service urged the public to stay at home and enjoy the cherry blossoms virtually via a bloom cam. They also warned that if the crowd gets too large, all access to the tidal basin will be shut down just like last year. Visitors still come in person, taking full advantage of this annual event while they can. After all, seeing with your own eyes is an experience hard to put in words. <laughs> Do you like the um, the pink ones or the white ones more? I don't know. I like both. For all the Americans, please come and, and enjoy this. The blossoms will remain for seven to ten days if the nice weather persists. Melina Weiskup and Lynn Lynn, NTD News. American Airlines is set to reactivate its entire fleet, including planes that have been sitting in storage because of the pandemic. In a financial disclosure to the SEC, the airline said it expects to, quote, reactivate most of its aircraft in the second quarter. American says ticket sales are about 90 percent of pre-pandemic levels. It says the jump comes after a decline in CCP virus infection rates and an uptick in vaccine distribution. On Monday, the CDC director noted the jump in air travel and said she is concerned it will lead to future surges. A famed Hollywood movie theater is finally welcoming audiences again. And monster movies are first to return to the big screen there. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Hollywood's most iconic cinema, the TCL Chinese Theater, announced its reopening on Monday. A host of monster movie directors, including Michael Doherty and Adam Wingard, cut the red ribbon in the courtyard to mark the occasion. Wingard's film, Godzilla vs. Kong, will be the first film shown at the theater. He said audiences are in desperate need of a distraction. It's been such a depressing year, 2020, and coming into 2021, that I think it's just time for us to be able to just turn our brains off and let a big Hollywood popcorn spectacle just do the, do the work for us. And, you know, it's really just about having fun and, you know, cutting loose and just being with a group of friends and family. Michael Doherty wrote the story for Godzilla vs. Kong. He described how the spirit of the film mirrors our collective experience during the pandemic. It feels like we're living in the aftermath of a giant monster attack. You know, we've all been huddled in our homes, taking very extreme precautions, dealing with this bizarre, surreal, collective tragedy, global tragedy. Um, it feels like we're all sort of living in a Godzilla or King Kong film. The TCL Chinese Theater was first opened in 1927. 
and is located in the center of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. For the reopening, the theater will space guests apart with plexiglass between seats and will sanitize between screenings. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And up next, Communist China and Iran sign a 25-year agreement to strengthen their alliance. Beijing agrees to safeguard the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, and Tehran urges the U.S. to remove sanctions in order to restart talks. A Hong Kong reverend helps sailors who can't come ashore because of pandemic restrictions. He hopes to bring comfort and connection from afar. That and more on NTD News. Nike is one of several brands targeted in a new wave of Chinese boycotts. That's over its position on forced labor in Xinjiang. But major Chinese sports associations risk hundreds of millions of dollars if they follow suit. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on that story. To boycott or not to boycott, this is a dilemma some Chinese sports associations are facing with regard to Nike. The American sports brand is one of the companies that said no to cotton from China's Xinjiang region. It cited concerns over forced labor. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, then urged people to boycott those foreign brands. Many brands, including Nike, are impacted. But two major Chinese sports giants, the Chinese Basketball Association and the Chinese Soccer Association, remain quiet. This despite strong calls for them to terminate their contracts with Nike. Football News posted on Chinese social media Weibo over the weekend that the Chinese Soccer Association condemned Nike's rejection of Xinjiang cotton as a wrong move. But the post was quietly deleted shortly after. Nike has been the largest sponsor of China's national teams for a long time. It has a contract with China's national soccer team worth over $400 million and another $100 million contract with a major soccer association. China's national basketball team players also wear Nike jerseys. Besides, Nike helps China communicate with the NBA so that the NBA can help train Chinese players. Chinese media Sina Sports comments that sports associations are in a dilemma. They might not have the legal basis to terminate the contracts. But when Chinese players wear Nike products during the games, some Chinese people will criticize them. And the biggest problem is Chinese sports authorities have not issued any guideline as to how to deal with Nike yet. Hugo Boss is another brand that faces boycotts in China over the issue of Xinjiang cotton. Three Chinese celebrities publicly cut ties with the German fashion brand over the weekend. And Chinese internet users slammed it as two-faced. Hugo Boss said last Thursday on Chinese social media Weibo that it would continue to purchase and support Xinjiang cotton. But a day later, it said the post was unauthorized and has now been deleted. It posted last Friday saying the company does not tolerate forced labor and urges its global suppliers to follow suit. It says the company has not procured any goods originating in the Xinjiang region from direct suppliers. On Saturday, it posted again on its Weibo, saying it cherishes all long-standing relationships with partners in China. Chinese internet users accused Hugo Boss for changing its position, saying the brand was being two-faced. The Europe-based association Better Cotton Initiative stopped certifying cotton products from Xinjiang last year. It cited forced labor there as the reason. That means these cotton products are put on a de facto blacklist in international trade. CCP mouthpiece CCTV reported lately that some cotton exporting companies in Xinjiang have lost more than $10 million since last year. China is the second largest cotton exporter in the world. More than half of all Chinese textile products are exported to other countries. The loss is not limited to exports. It's not clear yet if supply chains in the textile industry will leave China altogether. A 25-year agreement between Communist China and Iran. The two regimes are seeking to bolster their alliance. Beijing agrees to safeguard the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, and Tehran urges the U.S. to remove sanctions. Tehran and Beijing sign an agreement to further strengthen their economic and political alliance. This 25-year agreement brings Iran into the Chinese regime's Belt and Road Initiative. That's a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure scheme led by the CCP. Both regimes are sanctioned by the U.S., the Chinese regime for its human rights abuses and the Iranian regime for its nuclear development. The Chinese foreign minister said before the signing ceremony, 
Our relations with Iran will not be affected by the current situation, but will be permanent and strategic. The Iranian Commerce Ministry said days before that Beijing will also safeguard the 2015 Iran nuclear deal and the interests of their alliance. The Trump administration left the nuclear deal in 2018 and resumed sanctions on Iran. Trump said the U.S. has definitive proof that the Iran nuclear deal was a lie and that the regime has been pursuing nuclear weapons. President Biden, on the other hand, has sought to revive talks with Iran. But Tehran wants the current U.S. administration to remove sanctions first in order to resume any negotiations. Beijing praised Biden for his willingness to restart talks, saying, Under the new administration, the Americans want to reconsider their policy and return to the nuclear accord, and China welcomes their move. Wen Hui, NTD News. A reverend in Hong Kong tries to help sailors stranded at sea due to virus restrictions. Sailors struggling to cope with social isolation and mounting fatigue. A line. In Hong Kong's busy waterways, Reverend Stephen Miller is a beacon of light. Sometimes they're very happy to see you. <laughs> Coronavirus restrictions have made it difficult for those that crew the world's container ships to disembark and for replacements to take over. So Miller does supply runs for sailors unable to leave their ships delivering SIM cards and snacks via ropes <laughs> thrown from the deck. He says he does this out of fear for their mental health. You can just imagine it for yourself. You've been planning to go home. You've been planning to do things for your family or maybe see a young child for the first time uh, in many, many months. And that then is taken away from you. The International Chamber of Shipping estimates about 100,000 seafarers still currently stranded worldwide. Ritesh Mera was one person who felt the tides turn quickly. He went from being captain of a gas tanker last July to feeling like its prisoner. When he enlisted, he expected to only be gone four months. But he found himself still stuck aboard the same ship eight months later. So the thought of not being able to go back home in time and the thought of being chained to this particular place and in a way you can also say jailed is getting onto Kruna. Mera was forced to miss holidays and a funeral away from his family in New Delhi, all while having to manage a nervous crew, struggling with mounting fatigue and social isolation. Mera was finally able to leave the ship in March. Now he's preparing for quarantine before being reunited with his family. He says he used to think of having his son join him as an officer on the same ship, a dream he now thinks is better left at sea. And still to come, first fires and now flooding devastate a family in the Australian countryside. But they say they're holding on to what they can. Find out more on NTD News. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. 
Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. One man in Australia thought the worst was behind him when he saved two family properties from bushfires one summer ago. But this year, they floated away. Yeah, well, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'll probably have none at all. Um, yeah, I uh, don't know whether it's just someone tested me or, or what, but that is what it is, I guess. You get through it. Australian cattle farmer Robert Costigan thought the worst was behind him when he saved two family properties from raging bushfires in 2019. But in a cruel twist of fate, this year they floated away. His and his father-in-law's homes were swept off their foundations earlier this month when heavy rains caused rivers to reach their highest levels in half a century, submerging bridges and buildings. Walking through and around the family home, the insurance company has declared the property a write-off, with everything needing to be rebuilt. Costigan, his wife Bianca, father-in-law Brian and children Eva and Dre are now staying with neighbours. Their cattle and much-loved family pets were spared. Just disbelief. Um, heartbreaking to drive across the causeway and see, you know, house gone it's it's dead yeah just heartbreaking I guess I love a sunburnt country a land of sweeping plains of ragged mountain ranges of droughts and flooding rains reads the beloved our country by Australian poet Dorothea McKellar and for the Papambara community on the mid-north coast hinterland it couldn't be more true after years of drought, devastated crops and livestock across New South Wales, farmers battled through the country's worst bushfires in a generation in the summer of 2019 to 2020, only to face flooding amid a La Nina wet weather event this year. The same river system Costigan pumped water from to save his house from the bushfires has returned to destroy it with flood. But he's not giving up. We'll rebuild. Um... I've worked too hard to just walk away from it. Like, we've got brilliant community, brilliant friends. Like, the help that everyone's offered us is, is amazing. Thousands of visitors are flocking to an Icelandic volcano that recently erupted. Amazing footage shows flowing fountains of molten rock. Since the eruption started, people have hiked up some 18 miles southwest of the capital hoping to be awed by the rare lava fountains. Drone footage filmed on Sunday shows the changes in the shape of the lava flow and the volcano itself. Since the first eruption, lava has steadily seeped out in a flow strong enough to ensure the molten rock does not solidify and close the fissure. The Icelandic Civil Protection Department says the magma tunnel is not going to form new eruption sites. The department also said there is no way to predict how long the eruption would last. The stay-at-home order comes to an end in England as outdoor meetups and sports resume. It's part of the UK Prime Minister's cautious path out of lockdown. NTD's Jane Worrell reports. The latest easing of England's lockdown measures mean that outdoor sports, including tennis, golf and outdoor swimming, is back on. Groups of six can now meet outdoors or two household bubbles can meet. Scenes from golfers in Sheffield keen for an early start with everyone glad to be back. How would you describe it? Just happiness, really. Everyone's smiling, everyone's got a, you know, a happy story and they're pleased to see you and pleased to see each other. We have a family feel at this golf club, so it's, uh, it's like seeing long lost friends after, after 20 years, it feels like, yeah, it's really, really good. The Prime Minister, though, is urging caution with cases rising in mainland Europe and new variants that could put the vaccine rollout at risk. With an easing of restrictions comes a warm weather forecast over the next few days for much of the country. It's welcome news for these swimmers, up early for a dip in the Lido in South East London. I've really missed it, like, a lot. So I suppose, like, I'm really happy now I'm back. Like, I literally didn't sleep last night I, because I was so excited. I'm normally a pretty optimistic sort of guy, but even I've been waking up in the morning feeling pretty glum, not been able to come here. So, yeah, it's uh, this is the start of something new, hopefully. Start of, start of a fresh start now. 
tennis players have also flocked back to the court. I think because tennis is one of the few sports that can actually be played um, kind of in a safe but also organised environment, we are getting so many applications. Um, so there's currently like about five to six years waiting period if you want to become a full member. The next set of restrictions will be lifted at the earliest on April the 12th, when pub gardens and outdoor dining reopen and we can get that much needed haircut. The easing of England's rules comes as Wales dropped its Stay Local slogan on Saturday. Scotland and Northern Ireland will follow with similar relaxations in their rules in the coming days. Jane Wirral, NTD News, London. And soon we'll see a bathhouse that was discovered underneath a tapas bar in Seville. The excavation reveals a piece of Spain's Moorish culture and past. And the Louvre is one of the most iconic buildings in the world, and it has a hidden collection of works. Prospective visitors can view them online. Stay tuned to find out more. The discovery of a historic Arab bathhouse underneath a tapas bar in central Seville is revealing details of the city's Moorish past. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. In the shadow of Seville's most visited site, the Geralda, sits a tapas bar. The Geralda is the bell tower of the city's cathedral, built in the 12th century when the Moors ruled Spain. The bar owners took the pandemic as an opportunity to renovate. There had been rumors that it was a site of a hammam, or Moorish bath, but the size and detail uncovered has surprised everyone. The floor has been removed and the main baths uncovered, complete with skylights and Moorish decorative paintings. There are other Arab baths bigger than this one, but they don't have as many paintings as this one. All the walls are decorated. Elsewhere, only the ceilings are decorated. But here, all the ceilings and all the walls have paintings. Emilio Gonzalez Farin is a professor of Islamic studies at the University of Seville. According to Farin, the excavation of the building allows people to experience the old city. The importance of the discovery of the hammam is primarily physical. It is almost at street level, so you can see the traditional features of the Andalusian city. It even has pathways in the downtown district, where the current city may be. According to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Almohad Empire that emerged from Africa established the city as its base. It managed to reunify Arab Iberia, turning the city of Seville into the epicenter of Andalusian culture. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The Louvre Museum in Paris is using its pandemic-driven closure to its advantage. It's working to reorganize a secret collection of masterpieces that rarely go on general display. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Paris's Louvre Museum normally welcomes 10 million visitors a year. Although its halls are closed for now, the Mona Lisa still smiles over the galleries, and great masterpieces hang from the walls. But there's a much less well-known treasure trove of works here, if you know where to look. Xavier Salmon is the director of the museum's graphic arts department. It's a library which stores drawings, pastels, and miniature works, preserved so they last for years to come. It's extremely sad that due to the pandemic, we are no longer able to welcome our usual visitors. But the lucky thing is that the whole collection is online. Since the 17th century, the Louvre has accumulated a collection of 250,000 graphic arts that date from the 9th century to the mid-1800s. But they're not on permanent display. The department rotates just a few samples of the work every four months. Before the pandemic, the graphic arts department would welcome about 800 people each year by appointment. Salman says there are ways visitors can get ready for when this library is able to reopen. Those who want to prepare for their visit have time to go on our database, look at the drawings with the photos and the information, and then once they're preparing their trip to Paris, they can eventually come here and see the drawings. In the meantime, he's used the closure to reorganize and redistribute the works in an overhaul not possible before the museum's closure. For now, it is unclear when the Louvre will reopen its doors. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan.
Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.